Well, Wayne, it's good to see you again. Thank you, Doc. We measure our meetings in terms of books, and I think you've written three since the last time we sat down and talked. That sounds right. <laughs> this show is never timely, and this is a show for the ages. But uh, the first question, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was uh, your a piece you wrote while you were living in Florida, and it had been your, your position at that point that, that you were not going to go back and live your life in Alabama. You were going to have your career elsewhere. But you read To Kill a Mockingbird, and it changed your mind, and you returned to the state. And then the day before yesterday, that book, the book that moved you, <laughs> filled you with hope, <laughs> was banned for eighth graders in Biloxi, Mississippi. You're keeping up with that controversy? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, as you know, <laughs> it, uh, to, Kill to Kill a Mockingbird is actually one of the most banned books in the pantheon of American literature. And the last banning, ironically, so far as I know, was in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> it oh, was banned Lord. because of the use of the N-word and the fact that it made eighth uh, graders in Toronto really uncomfortable mm -hmm. to hear the N-word and renewed uh, memories of what the South was like and what America was like. And they just didn't want to import all of this racial division to Canada, which of course is only without such racial division, if you believe the Toronto School Board. And you're correct. Uh, as a matter of fact, our friendship with Harper Lee was based upon an op-ed column I did in which I was writing about this wonderful family in Monroeville, Alabama, father, mother, uh, three sisters, and son. The fact that uh, every one of them, in their own way, had become a remarkable person, but that my connection with them was in graduate school at Florida State University, where I had begun my doctoral program in 1961 and had uh, moved straight through all of my coursework, uh, my seminars, was working on my dissertation, and the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in Birmingham. I had not read any fiction for years since undergraduate school. Uh, and I remember going home, my wife and I went home in tears, or turned on the TV and heard the news and broke down crying. And I told her, I don't know where we will live after we finish graduate school, but I will guarantee you I will never take you back to Alabama again. So you have to watch the vows you make to your wife uh, in grad school. And within six months of that conversation, I had a short break between the time I finished my defense of my coursework and the beginning of my doctoral research trip up the East Coast to the FDR Library and the National Archives. And I thought, well, I'm going to read a book, and there's all this hype about To Kill a Mockingbird, and sure. she is from Alabama, and I'm from Alabama, so why don't I just pick up this novel and read it? And I was blown away. Of course, I read it right after the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church. And I go from thinking, that Alabama is a state controlled by Nazis and terrorists to thinking if someone from the south end of the Alabama Black Belt can so completely transcend her culture on behalf of a philosophy of justice and fairness, even among people who are conservative people, but still just and fair people. And I thought maybe I misjudged the state. So. Shortly thereafter, I finished my PhD. Uh, I have an offer from multiple schools. One of them is my alma mater in Birmingham. So I go back to Sanford. And in 1991, I wrote this op-ed column. I, my wife and I headed almost immediately to China, where I was working on a book about Alabama missionaries I uh, in China. Well. And uh, when I return home, I have this letter, uh, along with five pounds of other mail from Harper Lee. And she had read the op-ed column and the first letter in our correspondence was a letter in which she wrote me to thank me for the acknowledgement and the tribute to her family and then chide me 
for having made a slight mistake, which made her right. sister chortle, because I had promoted Nell to being the oldest of the three girls instead of the youngest, and uh, as was her custom, uh, a very nice introductory letter with a very chiding and satirical <laughs> postscript. Because of the exchange of letters with Miss Lee, and, and then the, the friendship that develops, and the visits that you and Darty made to Monroeville, you know more about that woman than almost anybody else alive. I mean, Alice is gone, and uh, many of her old friends are gone. So I have some, I have some questions about, uh, here's a, for example, uh, I read, I've read Shields, I've read uh, Mills, I've read all there is to read, I think, but there's still things I don't understand at all. First, all those years in New York City, she loved it, she loved New York City. What did she do? What was, her, what was a day like? Who were her friends? How did she spend that, was it 20 years in New York City? Paradoxically, pretty much like all Southerners who moved to Manhattan not knowing anybody, uh, she found a group of expatriate Southerners. Uh -huh. <laughs> there were, uh, depending upon whose account you uh, take on this, somewhere around seven to 12, all just after World War II, which is a period of shifting and merging of populations anyway. So there are a lot of young people, GI Bill kind of people, but yeah. also just an awful lot of folks who were tied to communities as she was because of her age and her connection to the University of Alabama as a student, or as was true of so many others. They were just coming out of military service and they were thinking, do I want to go back to Mejia, Texas, which was the case of Michael Brown, uh -huh. who was perhaps her closest friend, along yeah. with his, his fiancee then, a ballerina by the name of Joy Brown, who was the only one who was an outsider. She was raised in upstate New York. Uh -huh. But Michael Brown, Truman Capote, uh, a circle of, of people who would remain her friends for the rest of her life, right. sort of take her in in the case of Joy and Michael Brown, uh, they had three children. He was, he was as brilliant as Nell. He came from Mahia, Texas, a town about like Monroe. Uh, his father was a surgeon in the town. Mm -hmm. His mother died when he was young and his father remarried and the mother did not like him and he did not like the mother. So as soon as he could flee Mahia, Texas, he fled. Went to the University of Texas briefly, then winds up at the Air Force, and then at Yale. And he had been a mus musical prodigy. So he is in the process of writing songs, which ultimately became really important Broadway musicals, and also what were called industrial musicals. And these were a phenomenon of the time where a company like Esquire, for instance, uh, would hire him to write a, a musical and then invite all of the Esquire employees to that musical and that's the way, he never had a salary. Joy and Michael befriended Nell and it was in fact Michael who suggested to this very insecure young writer that she take some of her short stories uh -huh. over to Maurice Crane and Annie Laurie uh, Williams, the, um, uh, his wife, both from Texas, part of that uh -huh. southern circle. And it was uh, Maurice Crane who read her first sh short story and said, uh, I, I think this has tremendous possibility. And so that's uh -huh. the way the relationship began. But during part of that time, Nell is actually, first of all, working in a bookstore, Scribner's, for four months. Secondly, she's working as an airline clerk yeah. at yeah. Uh, Eastern Airlines, and then she's working for British Overseas Airlines. And because of the way in which airlines organize their shifts, you would maybe work from eight to, to four one day, and the next day you would work from four to two in the morning, and the next day you would work from two in the morning to uh, eight o'clock in the morning, and you never knew what your shifts were going to be, and it was just killing her. And, of course, you couldn't write in a s s setting like this. 
So the Browns said, why don't you just come and take our attic room, and we got these three kids, and you can help us watch after them, and you can just sleep here and go into work from here, and it's much closer to the British Overseas Airways headquarters in downtown uh, New York. And that way you won't have all this travel time where you're missing. And it was that friendship right. that in at Christmas time, 1956, resulted in, they always gave each other uh, presents of under a dollar. And of course, this is the famous story where they put an envelope on the tree. And uh, in an oral history I did with Joy Brown, she said, there was no money in it, but there was a letter in it. And the letter said, we love you. We believe in you. We believe you're going to be a great writer. And therefore, we want to take the money from the Esquire musical that Michael did. And he said, she said, we have this extra money that we did not budget for the year. We did not anticipate. It came in Christmas. And we want to give you enough money to pay your apartment, to pay your food, to pay your living cost, and let you quit your job at British Overseas Airways. And now we know, Don, to turn what she had already finished, which was Watchmen, into what became To Kill a Mockingbird. Right, right. So the Browns are the Medici's. They, they, of, they are the Medici's. They are the Medici's of, of Michelangelo. <laughs> was she a baseball fan, a Mets fan? She was a Mets fan. She hey. went often. I mean, really? Oh, went. yeah. Oh, she okay. loved Mets baseball. <laughs> And uh, that was the only thing that really divided her from this group of Southerners. Oh, yeah. Some of them were Yankee, Yankee fans, fans, and of course, she, for her, this was a matter of no small consequence. It's oh, sort of like her feelings toward Auburn, oh, coming yeah. from the University of Alabama, and where she would oftentimes introduce my wife and me this way. Someone would come into the Meadows of Sister Living, and she would say, these are the only two Auburn people I have ever liked. <laughs> and... Did she spend, I do not see, of course it's not in the two novels, but, but, but even the things that, that I read, I never see references to uh, painting. And yet I hear that she's, she was a, a, a avid, uh, not only, a, 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 a often went to the Museum of Modern Art and, and Guggenheim and, and, uh, and so on, but also was a contributor as well, quietly, I, I, th I think anonymously, was she keenly interested in painting? Uh, I myself know nothing about painting. I have trouble with stick men. Yeah, but she uh, was. But she was. And not only that, but according to her uh, nephew, Hank Connor, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, who is the family historian, she was a very good painter. And paradoxically, he says, probably the best painting she ever did was in Monroeville while she was full-time caregiver to her father who was dying of cancer. And uh, in the early 1960s, he said that uh, those paintings tend to be dark, tend to reflect the kind of emotional turmoil she's going through, changing her father's diaper, watching him die. And uh, they were left in Alice Lee's house for yes. the most part and he, has, he now has some of those paintings, and he says, Wayne, they're really quite exceptional. And they are, are they abstract expressionists? I are have they realistic? no idea. Ah. I have no idea. Uh, uh, this, is, this is something I learned very late and did not learn from Harper, but learned from, from Hank, and this is the first reference to it I had seen. I do know that you're correct. She loved to go to art galleries. Yeah. She loved to go to antiquarian bookstores. She loved to go to Broadway shows. Uh, she loved to go to lectures when people like Eudora Welty right. came right. and sure. lectured sure. in New York City. Uh, that is where she met Eudora Welty for the first time. And she said, you know, to me, Faulkner and Welty, they're the ones. They're the great well, ones. She's right. And. Uh, when I was Eudora Welty scholar at Millsaps College, uh, we took Miss Welty out several times, were invited to her house several times, and on one of those occasions, she mentioned the fact, do you know Harper Lee? And I said, no, not really. I mean, I'm acquainted with her through her sister who went to Auburn, uh, Louise Connor, and she said, I just love her writing her. I love Mockingbird, 
And I would so much like to meet her. And I said, well, actually, let me see if I can work this out. So I contact Louise Connor. I call her in Eufaula. And she says, well, let me run this by Harper mm -hmm. because I doubt that she would want to do this. But so uh, I call her back. And Louise said, she wants to meet Eudora Welty. Well, of course she Eudora does. Eudora Welty is her favorite writer. She wants to meet Eudora Welty. I said, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. She's going to take Amtrak to Atlanta. Then I'm going to come to Eufaula and pick you up. And Darty and I are going to take you to Atlanta. And we're going to pick up Nell at the train station. And we're going to drive to Jackson, Mississippi. And we're going to go to Eudora Welty's house. And Darty and I are going to sit there just quite as mice while the two great ones talk. And, it, and everything was worked out for that Christmas. And I'll be darned if Harper did not call Louise at the last minute and back out. She oh. said, I just, I just, I, I'm so intimidated by the thought oh. of meeting you, Dora Welty. And so it never happened. And it was a matter of real disappointment to oh. you, Dora, to, oh. to Miss Welty. Well, real that's a shame. Yes, yeah, it's, it's that's a just shame. terrible. <laughs> I want to write, I want to write a one act play in which the two of them are sitting, oh, do. Sitting, sitting in a room talking. Good. Something a little, maybe a little, I, let, let me preface this in one second. The first times I ever went to Monroeville, many, many years ago, uh, one of the things that was impressed on me was that, and this, this happened, this is not a single occasion, but uh, people, would, people spoke of, of Miss Lee with such reverence, and they were so protective in fact, I remember one day she was out on the courthouse walking around and somebody else wanted to take her picture from across the street. And one of the citizens said, oh, no, no, don't, don't interfere with her privacy. Don't, don't intrude. They, they were very, very protective and I thought affectionate, um, admiring. And in, your, in your, one of your sections of commentary, she does not seem to have liked <laughs> to have been as fond of the citizens of Monroeville as they were fond of her. Is that so? Am I right? And if so, what, what's that about? That or is that's so. That's the impression. Why is it so? No, I think that is so. Uh, and that is not to say that she did not love Monroeville. And it's sure. not to say that she didn't have numerous friends. The man who ran Bradley Restaurant, yeah, sure. for instance, uh, uh, her wonderful English teacher, Gladys Watson, uh, the woman who ran the library, she, she had all sorts of friends. Uh -huh. And her circle of intimate acquaintances uh, stretched so far beyond Darty and me. We were sort of late arrivals. Uh, we were, this was a friendship of old age for all yeah, of us. Sure, But sure. for Kathy Randall, for instance, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, they have been intimate friends far longer than Darty and I have known her. And so all around Alabama, but especially in Monroeville, there were people she knew so well. And uh, it's amazing that beginning with her stroke in April of 2007 and her rehab for six months at Health South, uh, where she was given a fake name so that no reporter, no people would find out that she was there. Uh, a good friend of ours, uh, uh, Tom Carruthers, who is with a large law firm and is a friend of Nell's, called us. We're just back from Toronto. And he said, Nell's had a stroke, and would you please go by to see her? Sure. So we did, and there were a handful of people, and we were given code names. It was like getting into the CIA to get in. I want you to know, the nurses knew about her, the janitors knew about her, the technicians knew about her, the doctors sure. knew about her, the administrators knew about her. They never allowed that news to reach the news media. Well, good for them. They never, the news media never knew she'd had a stroke. They never knew she was in Birmingham. For six months, they protected her. Same thing happened in Monroeville, with one exception, one notable exception, and this was a woman who was contacted by a reporter from The Independent in London. Uh, he had, uh, she had decided that she was gonna come over and do a 50-year anniversary story on the publication of To Kill a Mockingbird, right. which would have been 2010. Uh, she's looking around for somebody who will betray Nell's uh, location, yeah. how to get in touch with her. She finally finds one woman, uh, 
this woman calls all sorts of people, for instance, her physical rehabilitation trainer who was working with her leg and arm that were partially paralyzed. He would give her no information about where, what room she was in. But finally, this local woman just takes the reporter from the Independent, marches straight into the Meadows, which at that time was easy to do, but not after that. They walk in and there's the nameplate, Harper Lee, on her door. This woman goes in and she sees this woman who is suffering from macular degeneration and fairly profound deafness. And she tries to conduct an interview with her, right. breaking into her room with this other woman from Monroeville. And then she goes back to London and writes this, a story about this pathetic, demented old woman. Well, yeah. it's easy to think someone's demented if they have macular degeneration and they can't hear and you don't know how to talk to them, communicate with them. Mm -hmm. And so from that point on, uh -huh. they restrict entrance to the meadows. They take the nameplate off the door, put a fake nameplate on the door. So if you get in the meadows, you can't find a room. Uh -huh. But uh, with that one exception, as far as I know, everybody in Monroe protected her privacy, her identity. Uh, uh, that was always my impression. And speaking bluntly, it, it seemed as if she did not reciprocate. No, no. Well, she, part, of, part of, of her persona was not that she was introverted, not that she was shy, but she was intensely private. And that's one reason yes. why she bonded so well with my wife, because my wife is not shy and introverted. She enjoys, uh, she was a theater major for heaven's sakes, that by uh -huh. definition excludes being shy. But on the other hand, she's intensely private and she doesn't like to share my life and she doesn't like to share my world. She likes to be anonymous, go with me, but she does like to be upfront. Uh, Nell was an intensely private person and inside Monroeville, where everybody knew her or thought they knew her sure. or knew her sister Alice, and Alice was the most beloved person in Southwest Alabama probably, called the tax lady because she did everybody's taxes. <laughs> and as a result of that, the assumption that you knew her because you knew Alice, well, she left, hardly left it when she was 23 years old in 1949. And here are people in 2015 who think they know who she is but they don't intrude on her. It, we are out of time, but I, I'll, but I want to sneak in this one more, one more question. In your book, in one of the letters that you wrote to Miss Lee, you said, and I, I agreed 100%, you said, if you do not cooperate with biographers, biographies will be written anyway, and they will be filled with errors which could have been prevented had you or your friends cooperated. Now there will be more biographers and there, there, it, you <laughs> could conceivably be a biographer, although you have now the letters and the commentary which approaches it. Uh, wh what's the answer to the living, for the living writer? The living writer who says, don't write about me and people write anyway and they write with error later they're going to write again. Is there a solution to this dilemma? Uh, not in protection of privacy. Uh, it would be good if she had written her story so that she could leave that as a manuscript yep. after she yep. died. Uh, I suggested that. Uh, not doing that and I knew she wasn't going to do that because for one thing after the stroke it was very difficult for her to write at all. So my alternative was for 30 years first at Sanford and then at Auburn I had taught a course in American oral history. And the idea was to recapture the lives first of poor people whose story is always an oral narrative. It's never a written manuscript. So they don't keep journals, they don't write diaries. And I begged her, number one, to let me do it. Sure. And I, would, I showed her the legal form which an attorney at Auburn had written for me for the Auburn Oral History Collection. And I said, you can close this for your lifetime, the lifetime of all your children and right. grandchildren and great grandchildren. Anybody you want to close it for, you can close it. Or even better, because it would require a huge amount of research on my part, why don't you let Hank Connor, who is the family historian 
and who's old enough to have lived with your family in, in their house uh, next to Truman Capote. And I said, let him do the oral history and then put it at the University of Alabama or anywhere you want to put it, seal it, and then that story will be written. But in the absence of that, people don't, don't complain to me about Marsha Mills right. and, and Charles Shields because somebody is going to write your story and there's no point in you complaining about them getting everything wrong if, in fact, you don't cooperate and nobody else cooperates. Well, people are intensely interested. The Harper Lee story is not yet told, but I am confident that it will be. And I, I'm pretty confident we'll hear more from you as well. Well, Don, you know, what, the reason I wrote that book, uh, Mockingbird Songs, is because I felt in light of the untruths from the New York Times and all sorts of anonymous sources about Watchmen, the story that she was demented, that she could not give informed consent, that her mind was lost, that Tanya Carter waited until Alice Lee died in order to find the manuscript and was now profiting from the manuscript. All, all, this, all this crazy stuff that was generated in the absence of Nell saying anything, right. that it was darn time for somebody to know what's in those letters because anybody who reads those letters and thinks that at the end of her life she was demented, obviously didn't read the letters right. she was sending us. Well, the last word's not been said. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll just wait. People, more will be known. We are out of time, but it's good to see you again. Thank you. And Thank you. you're looking well, and you're going to speak tonight at... Uh, oh, one of my favorite venues, Theater Tuscaloosa. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. great. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Don.